Hey, everybody, this is Tom Sega from the Leader of the Pack podcast. And today's special guest is Alan Burgo, the Forager Chef LLC. Welcome, Alan. Hi, nice to be here. It's great to have you here. Alan's also an author and, and he's a chef and he's going to teach us all about foraging for really good edibles that most of us don't know about. In fact, we've been talking a whole bunch off the air and we'll get into that because he's going to teach me a few things as we go through this today as well. And so we're going to jump right in, Alan. And, and let's just hear a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And then where did you go to college? And tell us that fun story. Well, I grew up in Wilmer, Minnesota. Uh, and my family still has our family farm out there where we have a wind farm now. And I went to college in the Twin Cities. I actually went to business school, but I'd always been cooking. I'd been cooking like my whole life. And it's what I did as my side job. And what happened is I started working at really nice places in the Twin Cities, kind of said, I don't want to go work in a cubicle. I, I'm in the restaurant. I already have plenty of on-the-job experience. And I started to just work at the best places that I could possibly find. And as I got into these nicer places, I started to see that the most expensive and the most unusual, the most interesting ingredients that we would get in, a lot of them were wild. Uh, wild mushrooms, you know, we'd get morels, nettles in the spring, ramps, wild leeks, all kinds of stuff. And it, I started to see how valuable it was. I was out playing frisbee golf one day and I saw a mushroom that I had just cleaned in the kitchen the day before. And that's kind of when a light went off and I understood, hey, this isn't like some, you know, crazy thing. This is totally attainable. It's more about being in the right place at the right time. And from there, I just bought myself all the literature on mushrooms that I that I could find and just read up on it. And this is a, a very long process. Like we're talking about the span of like 10 years, I've been studying wild plants uh, and mushrooms, but I started out with uh, mushrooms first. And then sometimes you go out and you don't find mushrooms. And at this point, I was working at a restaurant where the menu changed every single day, and I was the one that was writing the menu. So if I went out to, I would pick ingredients to put them on the menu, and if I didn't find mushrooms, I wanted to get something. So then I started to teach myself about plants. And eventually, when I had my restaurants, uh, the Salt Cellar was uh, my first restaurant in St. Paul, and then I was the executive chef of Lucia's after that, both really hyper-seasonal restaurants. I would supply my kitchen with all the stuff that I picked and, you know, new ingredients are kind of like catnip for chefs. So I just wanted more and more and more. And that meant I needed to read and teach myself uh, more stuff as I kind of broadened what I was harvesting. Question for you. So you start as a business major. Yeah. And you end up as a chef. Uh huh. It's if you, pretty if you don't mind backing up a little bit, how does that transition happen? Well, that's actually pretty common in the restaurant industry. People will say like they get sucked in because it's a good side job. You know, a lot of people start off in like fast food. I did. I started working at McDonald's and then I was just like, oh, after a while, I was like, yeah, I'm probably done cooking at McDonald's. I've seen what this is about. And I went to nicer places. And it's that's pretty common, a pretty common theme in people's career paths in the culinary industry. No kidding. See, you learn something every day, even an old guy like me. So you work at some high-end restaurants, you own a high-end restaurant, and you talk about doing some foraging and bringing in kind of the fresh picks of the day that you went out and foraged. There's no types of regulations and things around that. You can bring in fresh ingredients that, that we went out and picked. So with mushrooms, you need to be certified. So okay. I'm, I'm certified. I'm certified now, uh, but it, it is a little bit murky and it was even more murky in the past. Uh, I actually sat on an advisory board for the state of Minnesota uh, with another chef of mine and a couple other people when they were trying to like come up with the mushroom regulations, like what should they be? You know, because before they weren't really, people weren't bringing them in, in the eighties and the nineties. Uh, I mean, maybe in California around New York, uh, but not really in the Midwest. And 
there what there wasn't a lot of regulation. So I would say that a, you know a lot of restaurants they if they buy from local people they're probably certified now. In the past, they probably weren't. And there's like ongoing jokes about oh yep the mushrooms are coming from the crazy guy in the creeper van that pulls up in the alley. And you would meet all kinds of characters. I mean, just like you do in the restaurant industry. Uh, I mean, wild mushrooms in the United States, they should be the largest cash business. Uh, out on the Pacific Northwest, you have the matsutake crop is really big. Morels are really big too. Uh, but there's all kinds of stuff that gets that gets bought and sold. And if you're going to private property and harvesting, it is completely legal. Public land is a different story. Whether it is unethical to harvest things from public land is kind of up for debate, in my opinion, because what are, you know, for example, what am I harvesting? I'm harvesting non-native invasive plants. The vast majority of things that I'm picking are non-native and invasive and could potentially be things that would disrupt our natural ecosystem here in the Midwest. Garlic mustard is a perfect example. Garlic mustard is like, a, it is a plague. And I mean, it's gonna, it will destroy like every single flower in the maple sugar bush here at the farm I live at in Wisconsin. We have to remove it by hand. So instead of, you know, throwing it in a bag, you could eat it. I don't love garlic mustard, so I don't eat a ton of it. I pull a lot of it every year, but nettles are a great example. Nettles sell for about 12, 10 to $12 a pound. That's more than any heirloom lettuce that I've ever heard of. Uh, and it's also a non-native invasive plant. It's called Urtica deoica, and it comes from Europe. We have a native nettle here, but it comes later in the season. Uh, so it's a, it is, that's a, there's a lot of stuff to unpack uh, with it. But sure, yes, it, it's totally fine to serve wild plants um, most of the time and, and, and wild mushrooms as well. Well, and you talk about, you know, that's public land. Well, you know, people hunt on public land. That's that's Good point. perfectly legal to do. And, and to whether you're deer hunting and or grouse hunting or pheasant hunting, if it's public land, you're able to hunt that. My question would be for anyone who wants to fight that as a, as a layman, hey, it's public land. Why can't I go harvest renewable resources? Yeah. And there is, we do have to make a distinction there because it is it would be illegal for me to go, you know, get a whitetail deer and then sell that to my friend's restaurant and have him sure. serve it. That would be illegal. Uh, mushrooms and plants, you know, we can say, Hey, you know, don't ever take anything from public land. But when people are harvesting, it's just, it's the reality is that it's going to happen. So I think we just need to figure out ways to tax it, which is what they do in the Pacific Northwest. You know, I support like harvesting permits and stuff like that. So there's limits uh, there, and then, you know, like conservation officers are getting more educated on this stuff so they can help enforce it. And that's another really helpful part. So yeah, it's a, it's kind of a complex issue. Something I, I, I on everyday conversations, we probably don't think about, but it's, it's, you know, like you said, it, it, the conservation end of it is very important because if we're going to be looking at at gathering these in the future we also need to conserve so that they do come back and we don't wipe everything out even if they i mean they're there may be invas invasive species but they're here now yeah but they are non-native you know like they're absolutely that could, that could disrupt things but e either way they're del they're delicious and eating them at home is a completely different story absolutely you met a guy along your trail here named Sam Thayer. And is he the guy who really got you into the education of foraging? Absolutely. Sam, I consider Sam a friend and a mentor uh, and someone that I look up to. His Sam is a writer and I would say the, the greatest forager in North America. And he lives a couple hours away from me in Wisconsin. And I met him right kind of as my last restaurant was closing. And after my restaurant closed, we did a few events together. And I started to hang out with Sam. And we would learn, I would learn new plants, like speed learning. And this kind of touches on another thing about foraging. A lot of people are like scared and think, oh, you know, I could pick something harmful, which is technically true, but usually pretty unlikely. 
going out with someone, if you want to learn about wild plants, going out with someone in the field that knows your local plants is hands down the greatest way to learn. And it's like speed learning. You know, you can, I could study things in a book for years and not feel comfortable enough to put harvest something and put it in my body. But if you go out with an expert, you will learn so much. And that's exactly what I did. So I taught, I started teaching myself about plants, but then when I started working and interacting with experts in the field, um, it really kind of changed the game. So I owe a lot to Sam. His books are the best books on foraging that I know of. He's got a whole bunch of them. He's got another in the works, um, you know, thousands of reviews of them you can find online. They are like the standard. No kidding. You know, and it, how would Alan, a layman, find somebody as a mentor in the foraging entity? Well, I don't know if you would, you know, necessarily find a mentor, but you can, there's people that you can, you can, you know, pay a class fee and they will take you out. Timothy Clemens, um, he's got a website and business called Ironwood Foraging. And he knows plants and mushrooms. He's in the Twin Cities. Uh, there's another one. Uh, I want to say it's Maria. And she's got four seasons, foraging.com. Uh, there's a bunch of mushroom guides. That's only in the Twin Cities. And they're doing classes like every single week, multiple classes in the Twin Cities. It's not that far from Duluth. Uh, the, let's see, Ariel Bunkowski in Duluth. She is part of a mycological society club that is basically for around Lake Superior. She's an expert, in my opinion, on your local mushrooms. Uh, so the Mycological Society is something you can join if you're interested in mushrooms, or if you want kind of like everything, plants and mushrooms, you could look for someone that'll take you take you out on a walk, and there's plenty of them. Ellen, let's, we're on the subject of mushrooms, and I have, for the last couple of years, tried to find morel mushrooms on some land I have up north. So I've done some, I've gone on the internet, I've talked to some friends and literally been at, at the land with FaceTiming on a telephone going, is this the kind of, you know, woods, forest that I should be looking at to find these morels? And they're going, yes, and these guys are good at it. They do it all the time and they're sending me pictures. Well, I'm two years in, and uh, I'm batting zero. I have yet to find a morel mushroom. And they keep telling me, oh, once you find one, then it's like they're, they're, you're going to find them everywhere. They seem to pop up that you just have overlooked them forever. How do you even begin uh, to look for a morel mushroom? That's a great question. And basically, it's going to come down to kind of knowing your, well, there's a bunch of things. But knowing your woods and specifically what kind of trees. So we have a whole bunch of different types of morels in North America. Uh, it's over 10 for sure. And each one of those morels is going to have certain conditions that they like. So up by you, let's say, do you have aspen? Absolutely. Well, okay. I'm going to bet that you have morels there. So what I see up there, what I would suspect that you have are going to be black morels. And those are going to be different than common morels. So common morels are the ones that people are going to be finding uh, kind of southern portion of Minnesota, like around in the Driftless area where there's lots of dead elms and stuff like that. Those are common morels, like grays and blondes. Uh, people describe them as black morels are very, very different. So they almost have, they're called one of the names of one of them is called Markella conica. So it can have almost like a pointed cap and it's also black. Like they are black uh, with a, a yellow stem, but they are visibly different from gray and blonde morels. You may have gray and blonde morels in your patches in your woods too, and they might grow side by side, like occasionally, but I would wager that it is going to be mostly black morels because that's really the only thing that I have picked up in your neck of the woods. And I was actually just out with my friend who wrote, literally wrote the book on harvesting black morels in Minnesota, Michael Carnes. I was out with him last year 
And I said, I, it's a mushroom thing where you don't ask people about the, where the patches are. It's like a code of honor, right? You can't, you can't tell people where your patches are. They're going to go there. You can, no one shares this stuff. So I said, Mike, I'm not trying to go to your patch, but could you just give me some tips? Or maybe <laughs> could I just come up one time, just one time? Blindfold and, me. <laughs> and we could go. I'll, you could blindfold me. Just put me in the trunk and maybe just take me to some woods that looks like the woods that would be good. And this is a great way to, to kind of learn terrain. Uh, if you have a friend in the Mycological Society or something like that. Um, and we found some. We just we went to a random spot and he said these conditions look look like what we're looking for. And those conditions are they are pretty specific. So aspen, but not aspen that are too too old and large. You want younger aspen. So and I would I would write this down is about the thickness of a soda can. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So that that's tip one. And then the next tip is you want them to be, you know, they're a colonial tree. So you, you want a colony of them. So not tons of other trees in there. You want like pure aspen stands and they should be about shoulder width apart. Interesting. Okay. And those are, those are your golden nuggets right there. The next thing, which is, you know, mushroom hunting is complex. You you also need to know about timing. So if you, there's all kinds of mushroom groups. There's at least four or five mush, wild mushroom hunting groups on Facebook. Uh, if you look on there, there will be people from Duluth posting in those groups. And you don't have to go in there and post anything. You can just kind of be a fly on the wall. And it's a really good indicator to see when things are popping. And because black morels are going to, even though it's colder, the black morels will start probably like a week before the regular morels down in southern Minnesota, even though it's cold. So timing is absolutely crucial. You know, morel season, other seasons are pretty long, but one thing that makes morels so special is their season is short. So you could have like two weeks of like prime morel season. And then on the tail end, it, it'll just kind of peter out and there, and there won't be too much. So the, you really got to hit it at the perfect time. But the good thing is if you go out and you only see some old ones, you still have a place you can go back the next year. And this, ta- this takes, it takes years. Um, you know, that's why not everyone hunts wild mushrooms, but that's also why it's so rewarding is because you're like unlocking one of nature's secrets, you know? So the timing is important. Once everything kind of starts to thaw, uh, May, probably first or second week of May, I am probably going to be picking some. So no kidding. You know, I don't want to make this. I don't want to make this podcast all into to morel mushroom hunting, but it's so interesting, and you hear so many people talking about it, and you you hit on it briefly earlier. And I know one of the biggest fears, because when I've told people that I wanted to start looking for mushrooms on my land, people are like, well, aren't you afraid that you're going to pick the ones that are going to, frankly, kill you? And I said, you know, everything I've researched and the people I've talked to said, you check with us when you first find some, we'll walk you through it, all of that. But really, it's like night and day when you find a good mushroom versus it's opposing uh dangerous mushroom absolutely so with the with the really common with the most commonly eaten and probably to be honest the best eaters the ones that people eat the most of it is really hard to get a look like and with the with the top mushrooms that people eat the ones that people really get excited about if you even were to pick something that was not the correct one, you'd probably just get an upset tummy. So okay. when you start getting into more advanced mushrooms, and if you want a list of some of those, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go over some of those. When you start getting into more advanced mushrooms, then you have to start doing some more research. Um, but 
I don't know anyone that's eaten a lethal mushroom. No kidding. Interesting. Well, you, you hear you hear about it like very very sporadically, but when it when it does, it's like oh, the, all these people are dying. No, they're not. You know, and people do this in Italy, France, Spain, like the whole of Europe. America is very. We're not the norm. We are not the norm when it comes to harvesting wild mushrooms around the world. Just about, you know, any place that can have good mushrooms around the world probably has a tradition of eating them and hunting them and enjoying it as a sport. It seems like it's becoming more popular around here because I'm I'm reading about it more. And, and yes, I've looked for them the last couple of years, so maybe I'm, I'm a little bit biased to that. But it just seems like I'm seeing more. Maybe it's with social media. Maybe it's with uh, just you know access to so much information that we have now. But that that people are looking more for you know what can some of these God given creations? What can I do to get some of these and and make them edibles for me? You know, and and I know that you in your career, you've made a career out of it now. And I want to talk a little bit about that, Alan, that that you went from being a chef full time to creating your own brand. Tell us about that journey for you. Oh, that was a journey. So after after my restaurant closed, I was just heartbroken. Uh, but I had been working on my website for probably six years and it had, it had a decent following and it was a, it was a lot to do that and to be working a chef schedule at the same time. But when the restaurant closed, I sold my three part book series. So the, yeah, the first one just came out last year. It's going into its fourth printing already through Chelsea green. And that one's all on plants. Um, I started doing kind of freelance work and I thought, I would just go back to a restaurant someday. I didn't know exactly when that was, but I knew that I needed to take a break because I was just, I was burned out. And, you know, you hear that all the time with the culinary industry for good reason. And I started shooting some more videos, working with some videographers, uh, doing grant work, uh, freelance product photography. I started working with lamb and goat farm and making video content for them myself. I started doing all these kind of weird things and I turned it into basically a machine where a couple of years later I'm self-employed and now I do, I stopped doing some of the other things and I honestly kind of hunt plants and mushrooms, put pictures of them on the internet. And that is basically my job. It's, I kind of got to pinch myself sometimes, but it's, it's a thing. It's very different from, I could have never imagined that I would be doing what I'm doing now. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, sometimes the, the worst days bring out the best futures. You know, you go through something so trying as, as the restaurant closing and, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to go out and find a job, you know, for somebody else, working for somebody else. And you found a way to parlay that into not only what you love to do, but into a business where you can thrive and do both at the same time. Absolutely. That is, that is pretty cool. Pretty cool creation that you've done creating a company out of it. Um, but, and, and also being an entrepreneur where this is not where you expected to be 10 years ago. Not at all. That, that's, that's pretty cool. So you were on the Duluth Pack blog, uh, the Duluth Pack report. And one of the things you talked about was chicken of the woods. And that intrigued me. Tell me what chicken of the woods is. So chicken of the woods is that's one of those like safest mushrooms out there that are super easy to identify that anyone can find if you go outside during the summer and they're delicious. They taste like chicken. They have a texture of chicken and people just love them. Uh, you want to get them nice and young. They get a little rubbery and tough as they get older just like you wouldn't want to leave a potato in the ground for too long. Um, but they're really easy to find and they're 
very, very easy to identify. I think they're one of what people call like the foolproof five. One of them is chicken of the woods. And where are they located? I mean, is that in all the states in the United States for, for our listeners or is it more regional? I would suspect I'm, I'm not an expert on like all of North America. Mostly the Midwest is where I, where I hunt, but it should be, I would say the majority of the states probably have some type of chicken of the woods. I mean, even in Alaska, they have a, a type that grows on pine trees. Some people shouldn't probably shouldn't eat that one. But if you have oak trees, you probably have chicken of the woods and you probably have hen of the woods too, which are probably equally as good. Some people probably like them a little bit more. Interesting. Talk about, Alan, some of the seasonal delicacies. We, delicacies. We've talked a lot here about mushrooms, but foraging is so vast. Can you talk about some of the seasonal delicacies that you love and that may be right in, in front of all of our faces that we should all be trying? Yeah, there are a lot. And it's kind of like there's always something to get during the season and you kind of you start having to make choices about which ones you're going to go out for. Like I'll call my friends and like, oh, are you going out for nettles? Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go get a whole bunch this year. You know, let's go together. We'll make plans just to go get nettles. Uh, nettles are a perfect example. Uh, when they first come up, they're one of the first greens to come up in spring. And you have a tr- nettles are probably one of the most widely and heavily consumed wild plants in the world, along with watercress, because this is so widespread. Uh, they're also they're also a textile. In India, people make rope from them because they're cat, they're related to hemp, but they're super delicious. When I cooked for the Swedish ambassador a few years ago when he was in, he requested nettles on the menu, so we made tortellini at one of the restaurants I was at. Uh, that was one of the things I was going to ask. So let's talk about nettles. What, what kind of dishes, if people are going to go out and they're going to forage and they're going to say, okay, it's widespread, there's nettles. And I heard this, this Alan Burgo guy talking about it. I'm going to go get some. Now, what do I do with them? Well, you do not have to do anything fancy at all. It's just going outside. Foraging for me is just like going to a grocery store. So I go to the nettle aisle when, when they're on (laughs) sale and and I fill I'll fill the back of my car and all you have to do I, t- I tell you what is just put them into a steamer or you can blanch them in some salted water. And that's all you have to do. A pat of butter and some salt at the table, a little bit of lemon. They, they don't even need anything else. There's all kinds of things that you can do with them. But to start out, I would just steam them. Steaming is very different from uh, boiling in water or blanching. With nettles, you know, nettles sting. These are stinging nettles. They're the same things that will that people call weeds. You know, I don't really like that term. But the stingers, you can remove it, and people remove it around the world a whole bunch of different ways. You can dehydrate them, and that rem- and that removes the. Uh, it's called a trichome, like a, it's almost like a little crystal. So you can dehydrate them. You can crush them, like. In Turkey, they actually make a salad out of raw stinging nettles. Someone from Istanbul sent me this recipe. And he put a, he, he says, Grandma will take a rolling pin and roll it over the nettles. And it removes this thing and they have it as a salad. I haven't tried that one yet. Uh, you can also blanch them or cook them. So heat is another way that you can make the stingers go away. And they're, they're just so delicious. Uh, but they have a they have really unique flavor, like Stinging nettles, they almost have like an oceanicness to them. Uh, the wood nettles that you guys also have up there, those almost taste like they're like flowery, like uh, they smell like apple blossoms when they're cooked to me. They're a completely different flavor. Um, both of them are very, very good. Let's talk about the stinger. Because right away it's like, well, I don't want to go there because I know I'll mess it up. And and uh, what if you if you didn't remove the stinger, what would happen? Oh, your mouth would probably get pretty warm. Okay. I mean, they'll they'll sting your hands. I don't think anyone is going to put nettles in their in their mouth raw. You can actually, and Sam and I will do this on occasion with people. You can take the nettles and roll them in your hand, and it will break up the trichome, the crystals. And you can pop them into your mouth and eat them and nothing's going to happen. 
but you get you got to you just roll them around for a little bit. It doesn't take more than a second or two. Um, so there's really nothing to be scared of. I don't even use gloves when I pick them when they're very young. Uh, wood nettles have much worse stingers, so you want to use gloves with those. But all these things are they're food and they're expensive food. I used to pay hundreds of dollars a week for someone to literally bring me garbage bags filled with nettles. And if you if you were to gather them, the wood nettles without gloves are just like a burn sensation. It'll just, it'll itch. Okay. Yeah. It, it'll okay. burn a little bit. It'll... So nothing nothing bad. But if somebody wore gloves and then they they went and went on the internet or looked up your book, you would explain this. Absolutely. In, in your book, and we'll get to that because Alan's book is Foragers. Forager Chef's Book of Flora. And we'll talk about that as, as, as we go along on you writing this book. And we want to make sure that people know where they can get it so that they can start having fun uh, this spring. Because, you know, we live way up north here for people who don't. And last week we were in the 30 below zero with wind chills that were crazy below zero. And just before we started recording the podcast, I ran outside for a few minutes and I didn't have a jacket on today because it's nice and warm and getting up in the 30s and which feels like the middle of the summer to us here. So, Alan, it's not that far off. It isn't. Pretty exciting times here. Talk about creating your website and and what you do with your website? Are you selling off your website? Are you educating off it? Or are you doing all the above? Well, so the website, it started as a journal. When I was, when I was working at a restaurant, you don't make a lot of money working as a chef. I was living in my friend's basement and I would cook him breakfast with stuff that I was bringing into the restaurant just about every day. And he said, Alan, this stuff is so cool. Like, what are you going to do? We need to, uh, he was an SEO analyst. So he said, I'm going to start you a website. So he built it up and I went in there and thought, okay, so the website's up. Now it must be done. And basically what it is, it's, it's a teaching tool. There's a lot, there's information on harvesting things. It's not like a scientific site or really like a, a foraging guide per se. There's lots of information on there and, and there are definitely like tips about avoiding, you know, poisonous species and stuff like that, but it's not like a field guide per se. What I do is I try to break things down. I fi- I figured I try to break things down for the layman because I figured, Hey, I'm a chef. I'm not a botanist. I'm not a mycologist. If I can teach myself how to eat, you know, 50, 60 species of mushrooms and probably double that in the amount of wild plants that I eat. I think anyone can do it. You know, I don't have a, I didn't have a scientific background. I didn't need it. And I I think that that makes it more accessible to people. You know, I'm an, I'm a normal guy. Uh, I'm just a professional cook and a professional eater, you know? So there's lots of information on there, probably a thousand articles where Two thirds of them are the recipes people can make and cooking tutorials, um, helping people troubleshoot things. You know, what's the best way to cure and dry and crack and eat black walnuts? That's an example of something you might find. Or how can you differentiate all the different types of wild rice that you might see in a store and which one is the best and what is the best of the best? Th- things like that. Tell us a little bit about wild rice, because I know, you know, again, maybe we're being a little bit centric to Minnesota and maybe northern Minnesota in our discussion. But tell us about wild rice. I know at Duluth Pack, we sell several different kinds and or types. I shouldn't say kinds, several different types of Minnesota wild rice. And to be honest, I never knew which one should we ever buy. Can you educate us a little bit on that? Yep. So the first thing you'll probably see is like grades, like, oh, it's like soup grade. One of the issues that's so confusing is there's no standardization of the names. Okay. So the best wild rice, like the stuff that I buy, real wild rice, 
natural wild rice, lake rice. Uh, it could be called any of those, but those some of those names could also refer to the wild rice I don't really buy. So it, it, is, it is a complex issue, but basically you want to know where you're getting it from. And images of the product will help you separate uh, separate out what you want, but also the price point. So the best wild rice is pretty often going to be the most expensive wild rice. And that's for a reason. It's going to taste better. Uh, but the, the best, the easiest way, I'd say, that you can separate the wild rice that most people think of as wild rice and the really, really good stuff is just by looking at the two side by side. And I have plenty of pictures of that. So black patty rice or the commercially harvested wild rice, it might just because it says Minnesota on the bag does not mean that it's the best wild rice at all. And there's actually a chemical, a, a natural enzymatic process that separates the two and creates very, very different flavors. So when the wild rice is harvested, sometimes with the black patty rice, the stuff that takes forever to cook, mm -hmm. it will be left to basically rot. And as that happens, this is before it's shelled. And as that happens, during, during that breakdown process, as it sits, as it sits wet, the seed coat will harden itself. And I can only assume that's to... Uh, preserve the potential for seed germination. And that process makes that shiny, rock hard wild rice. Okay. Parched wild rice or natural wild rice is not left to, left wet. And after it's harvested, it's toasted or it's dried. And now there's all kinds of different ways uh, that you can, you can get gas parched where it's like cooked in a gas skillet. You can get it where it's cooked over a wood fire. Um, Native Americans probably first cooked it, parched it in uh, clay pots, and then they moved, they moved to iron uh, after the colonists showed up. But that, for me and for just about everybody that eats it, it drastically improves the flavor. It shortens the cook time. Natural wild rice is going to cook in about 20 minutes flat. Black patty rice, we're talking an hour. And it's not going to be these pretty, these perfect, it looks like natural wild rice looks like rice when you cook it. Uh, my chef friends and I used to differentiate wild rice in the kitchen by saying, uh, which wild rice did chef get if someone made a mistake or something? And we'd say, did you get the good wild rice or did you get curly worms? Because the patty rice will always cook up and it will have to kind of like explode. And because it takes longer to cook, uh, also absorbs, I want to say about twice the amount of water as parched wild rice because it's par cooked. So eating that black patty rice, that's why you see it mixed with other stuff. You will never see natural, super expensive wild rice mixed with any kind of rice. So if you have like a wild rice blend, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be cooking with that. Uh, Interesting. Or, or it can just help you know which type of rice is, is which. So the black patty rice soaks up way more water. That means it's heavier to eat, which is why they often, often mix it with stuff like Uncle Ben's wild rice blend. Natural wild rice, you just you can eat bowls of it with blueberries and maple syrup for breakfast. You, you can just eat and eat and eat. It's just delicious. And most of the places like the gas stations up by you guys, everybody's got good wild rice there. It's just the more expensive stuff. And they'll have soup grade, the black stuff. They'll have it all. You just got to know how to pick through it and find the natural or lake rice, it might be called, uh, wild rice. That is so interesting because I have had wild rice on many different dishes that are both ends of the spectrum that you just described to us. And when you talked about like, uh, and there's times when I thought, well, boy, this might make really good bait for crappies because it looks like little wax worms. <laughs> And I now I now understand why. That is very interesting. And they can find all of this information for our listeners at foragechef.com or your handle at foragerchef. And you can find all of this information and they can buy your book and all of those things, correct? Yep, absolutely. I mean, some people say they just 
type whatever thing they just picked in the field plus my name into the search bar and then they use that as their search engine we have this whole season called foraging that's coming up and i can tell you you get all excited about it because when we were talking about it, you lean forward and you're you're getting all revved up what does alan do in the winter because of, in this part of the world where you and i live there's a lot of snow out there right now are, are you digging through the snow foraging or what do you do in the winter other than just consume all the good edibles that you foraged all summer long? That's exactly what I do. Uh, the winter is a time for processing things. Uh, I crack nuts. I just finished making a gallon or two of acorn flour. I have like 50 or 60 pounds of butternuts and probably double that of black walnuts. I crack a lot of nuts. I also work with a lot of meat. So we raise beef, rabbits, chickens, and sheep on the farm that I live at. And I butcher all of them. And then not all of them for the whole thing, but, I, but I'll, on occasion, I'll work with all of those. And I do harvest sheep and I'll work with the whole thing. Deer, I work with a lot of deer too. So basically there's a lot of meat that is getting eaten and I love butchery is like my second love, uh, but, but it's part of the wild, wild food world too. the venison, you know, small game. I work with all kinds of stuff like that, but I'm working through a lot of deer and probably working closely with the lamb and goat farm that I, that I work, that I work with. I do, I handle most of their, most of the stuff on their website and kind of manage their content creation as well. Well, I see maybe a book coming out in the future, Alan, that uh, has wild game and foraged, foraged edibles as a complete dish, as a cookbook. I mean, potentially, that, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, my book series, it's actually a series. The first one is flora, so plants, fungi, mushrooms, and fauna, so meat. So meat is like the third book in the series that won't be out for a number of years, but it's on, it's on the list. You know, it's interesting because as we've been talking, I'm an avid hunter and I consume everything that we do hunt, which is only the ethical and the best conservation that you could, you could ask for. And I'm all excited because I want to try some of of the things you're you're talking about if i could find them i guess i need better glasses because i'm probably stepping on them but with wild game i would love to mix the two i mean i i'm just sitting here thinking about uh smoking some some venison backstrap or a roast and cutting that real thin and then having sauteed morels with it and and maybe some nettles in there and as a side dish and and whatnot and it's like how cool would that be? It's like, I, I got it all from, I didn't have, to, like you said, the grocery store, the grocery stores out there, not walking down aisle number one through 32. I, I can just, I'm picturing in my head, Alan, that how cool would that be to sit down to a, a meal that everything was from just conservation and the forest? Yeah, I eat like that pretty regularly and one of the cool things there to, to mention is these are all luxury ingredients you know i said nettles are like 12 dollars a pound uh morels you're probably gonna pay 30 40 50 dollars a pound fresh during the season venison i have paid 50 dollars a pound for farmed venison you know so i i, I always try to re remind people that the things that you're harvesting it's a grocery store, but it's like the best grocery store that you've ever been to. You know, it, it doesn't get any better. And I'd like to remind people that, you know, the outdoor industry as a whole, which really you fall into through COVID has really grown. And this is something families could do as hopefully we're at the tail end of this, this pandemic. But I'm just thinking about families where they can learn and they can go foraging and they can make it a fun family outing in the outdoors, in the forest, away from people, in nature, and teaching kids some really great things and how to respect our forests we have and, and what the forest can 
actually give to you. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking here on, on people listening to this that go try it, go research, buy Alan's book, go on his website, follow him on social, and, and he'll keep you up to date on what's, what's happening at that time. And you can go do it as families and have a fun time doing it. And then yet you're passing on great skills to your children and you're still spending time in the outdoors. What a great, Absolutely. what a great thing to do. Let me ask you, Alan, what's your favorite meal from foraging that you make for yourself? Whatever is up at the moment. Oh, it, come it's, on. It's, There's got to be no, one that's, there, Alan. But that's like the best part is because it's constantly changing. Okay, Moros. <laughs> I knew we could get into it. <laughs> I hope you're not just saying that because I was so interested in it before we started. Okay, Matutaki. Okay, what is that? Uh, it's a mushroom that's super prized in Japan. They used to go for like hundreds of dollars a piece. And they actually grow up near you guys. They're very rare. They're like a holy grail. Okay, you come and visit me this spring and, and we'll go and we'll look together. All I want is one. You can have the rest. All right. We'll make a deal out of it. Alan, give us some cooking tips just for the average Joe, me, the guy who really can't cook. Give me, give us some tips on how we can use some of these ingredients that are out in Mother Nature that are just such good table fare. Just give us some tips on how to start doing this because it is something that's, it, it's kind of way out of, I think, most of our wheelhouse. Well, you, you go to a place, probably some private land or maybe even your own backyard or your garden, try picking some nettles in the spring and then you cut them with the scissors, maybe wear gloves your first time, wash them off, dry them, put them in the fridge and really f fresh plants, depending on the plant, they can last weeks in the fridge. There's one plant I picked that lasted, it's lasted over a month in my fridge at home. And I don't sit around eating month old greens all the time, but it, you will never get anything fresher than the stuff that you harvest yourself. So I, I just incorporate it in wherever I'm cooking leafy greens into meals or if I'm making grape leaf rolls or, or things like that, you know, I just incorporate it into, into my diet wherever I'd eat leafy greens because I think a lot of people could eat more leafy greens. And that's one of my favorite parts about the growing season. This just popped into my head. People are spending a tremendous amount of money killing dandelions in our yards. What you read all over that you can, there's so much edible in it that they're good tasting. What can you enlighten us on, on eating dandelions and what we, can we use those for? It's a great question. So dandelions are, sometimes people use them as like a joke, you know, uh, the dandelions are technically a wild chicory and wild chicory are eaten all over the world, especially in Italy. So Italian recipes, specifically from Southern Italy, also Greece, have lots of usage of dandelions. And one thing you can do, uh, first, you want to make sure you're picking it at a time when the dandelion is going to be the best to eat. So this is when the dandelions are going to be young. I'm probably not picking them when they're making flowers. Uh, they're going to have a stronger taste at that point in the growing season. And dandelions are going to have a stronger taste than most people are accustomed to in their greens. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but there are lots of people around the world that crave that crave a, a bitter taste in greens. Um, Italians might take some bitter greens, like you could take nettles and dandelions and mix them together, uh, blanch them in some salted water and then cook them up. You put a little garlic in a pan with some butter, warm it up until it gets aromatic, add the greens, toss them around, a little bit of spicy chili pepper, a pinch of salt, a little bit of lemon juice, and you cook them. This is a golden nugget here. You cook the greens until they are tender and taste good to you because everyone is different. Interesting. 
This has been a lot of fun, and, and we're going to circle back around, but we have a segment now, Alan, called the Packed Question Segment, and it's just to just dig deep a little bit on you. A couple of questions here. Biggest career achievement so far? Being self-employed and waking up every day doing what I want. That's pretty cool. Favorite place you've ever visited? Oh, Provence. South of France. Why was that? The food, and I got to meet one of my culinary idols and go eat at his restaurant. Perfect. Bucket list. There you go. Biggest fear? Death. Oh, not so scary, is it? I was. I thought you were going to say walking around a tree looking for morale and there's a bear on the other side of it. Uh, unless it's a grizzly, I'm fine. You're good. So, folks, today we have been blessed with having Alan Burgo, the forager chef. He is getting very well known all over the place. He has some books out, the Forager Chef's Book of Flora. You can find Alan at the Forager Chef or foragerchef.com. All kinds of great information. You can also find Alan at Duluth Pack's The Pack Report from December 17th of 2021. He was gracious enough to, to bless us with that. And we appreciate your time so much today, Alan. I personally have learned so many things. I just, I want, I want you to come up here and go out in the woods with me because I want to follow you around and see what you look for now. But, but I think people are looking for activities like that. And I think your timing is so good with all of this. And, and we just really appreciate you sharing some of your knowledge uh, with us and, and just really just, you're talking about cracking nuts. I think we just cracked a little bit, little little fissure yep. in that nut today. But people can find a lot more at all of your web at your website, in your book, at your your social media handles. And people, please support Alan and what he's doing. This is all natural stuff. It's great, Alan. Thank you for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. We appreciate it so much. And folks, until next time. And this is perfect. Unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors. Purse, 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 purse.